Hello and welcome to episode 48 of the Crash and Ride podcast. I'm Patrick Ferguson. I'm your host. Hey, welcome back. It's been a couple of days since I've had an episode up. I've been traveling around for the holidays and stuff, and I wanted to jump back in with a song explication on one of my favorite songs of all time, a song called Quiet Whiskey by the jump blues singer Winoni Harris. If this is your first episode of Crash and Ride, Crash and Ride is a podcast about mental health and music. Um, Every other episode, I do a song explication, which is what this is, where I just go from one end of a song to the other and talk about what I love about it, when it was recorded, some of the historical context around it, who was on the session. I mean, if that information exists, like some of this stuff is kind of obscure. The Swinoni Harris session we're going to talk about today was cut in 1953, and I I don't know who's on it. There doesn't seem to be anything on the Internet about who played the saxophone solo and that kind of thing. But I'm going to tell you everything I could find out about this track. So um, the other episodes of Crash and Ride that aren't song explications are long form interviews where I talk to musicians who survived anxiety, depression and addiction. The idea being that if we could talk openly and honestly about our suffering, we could start to see some of ourselves and others and all get better at the same time. Okay, so before I talk about Winoni Harris, I want to talk about Jump Blues a little bit. You can ask pretty much anybody, and they'll say the jazz and the blues had a baby, and they called it rock and roll, et cetera, et cetera. But they don't talk about the transition period. Like the 1930s were the sweet bands, big band dance orchestras, Benny Goodman, Tommy Dorsey, Glenn Miller, early Duke Ellington, like this sort of big band swing orchestra, highly orchestrated kind of um, jazz ensemble, large big band jazz ensemble playing And that was kind of the core of pop music all the way through the 30s and kind of into the 40s. And we talk about the advent of bebop right after the end of World War II. The tune Salt Peanuts by Dizzy Gillespie comes out. And some people, I mean, I realize I'm not a jazz historian and I may be like about to put my foot way down my throat. But I think that was kind of considered the first bebop tune. Smaller ensembles, uh, flatted fifths, longer improvisational sections like... um, That was the sort of beginning of bebop. But on a less kind of haute couture, higher plane, more gut bucket, barrel house thing, there was this thing called jump blues. I've also heard it called jump jive, and that eventually evolves into rhythm and blues. Um, But this is the um, sort of early 40s to late 40s uh, big band but with a backbeat and now when i say backbeat let me define that for people that aren't drummers um and this is kind of an interesting sort of semantic thing with rhythm sections like the backbeat means just snare on two and four so prior to the jump jive era most jazz had this uh swing pattern on the rider hi-hat cymbal that uh, a lot of the old time guys refer to as shoot the dog, shoot the dog, shoot the dog, da 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 da, little dotted eighth note thing that makes it swing, right? That swing, ba 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 ba. And um, with the advent of the backbeat, instead of getting one and a two and a three and a four, and then the snare is just an accent like gak at the end of the phrase or something, you get one, two, three, four, one, two, and snare and snare, and that is um, considered kind of um, primal by academics and uh, sort of cultural commentators, but audiences loved it because it made it super easy to dance. Now, jazz, as we kind of think of it now, is almost kind of academic, like I just said, and kind of dry, and people don't generally dance to it. But understand that in the 20s and 30s, like, Jazz music was dance music. Stomping at the Savoy with Chick Webb Orchestra, that's just all about dance contests at the Savoy Ballroom in New York City. And a lot of these tunes were backdrops to like jitterbug contests and other Lindy Hopping and all these other sort of dance crazes of that era. Chick Webb, by the way, uh, is credited with being the inventor of the drum trap kit or drum set, as we call it. But I just wanted to parenthetically like slide that in there just so you remember it. So as this cultural moment with jazz music is happening in New York City and all over other parts of the rest of the country. Um, Dance was just integral to it. Like Jazz music was the background to dancing. And I have seen it credited to Scott Joplin, although I don't know where I would research this, but Scott Joplin, the ragtime composer, once in an interview or a memoir or something once said that improvisation in jazz was created to stretch out tune so that people could keep dancing if you're hitting the end of the last chorus of a jazz tune and the dance floor is full 
You know, the alto saxophone player might stand up and rip off, you know, 18 bars of a solo so that they could kind of stretch it out and then hit the head again. They call it hitting the head, which is just playing the chorus again. And then maybe the tenor player would get up and play a solo. And you could go, like, for an extra few minutes to kind of keep the party going. And naturally, you know, sax players or other horn players who are good at this would would be rewarded with more solos and kind of be a guy you would want to recruit for your orchestra. So there's a little like jazz context without getting into the whole culture of head cutting and who was really, really good at improvising like Charlie Parker or someone like that. So outside of New York City, um, I would say, although not with any real certainty, but my feeling is that jazz music was black music. And there were scenes all over the country, St. Louis, Chicago, Kansas City, especially Kansas City, and uh, of course L.A. And and, um, as soldiers began to return from World War II, there was an emerging black middle class who had time to spend and money to spend on entertainment. And I feel like there's this kind of forgotten period of music history between 1940 and 1952 of jump chime and early rhythm and blues and when you hear this music with performers like big joe turner lewis jordan winoni harris you start to kind of understand where rock and roll came from because that backbeat is really powerful and the music has a drive to it it's in a one four five and we'll talk about one four five in a minute um which is a blues sort of standard song configuration. And like I said, we'll, we'll talk about one, four, five in a second, but that's where rockabilly came from. And rockabilly, of course, is what gave us this whole explosion of rock and roll with Elvis Presley and Jerry Lee Lewis, Eddie Cochran and Carl Perkins. And, and like that music comes straight from jump blues. And when you begin to understand just how black this music was and what a threat to the status quo it was, you begin to understand why there were anti-dancing laws and this like, satanic panic of all these christian leaders who were against rock and roll because because let's face it like a lot of protestant white christianity is really just a veil for race politics they're not burning giant stars of davids in those pastures in places where the clan is active they're big crosses and this black music on jukeboxes in white-only establishments was a cultural beachhead. And, you know, when you hear, like, the Father Coughlin types of the world, you know, ranting and raving about the backbeat being sexual and Elvis Presley's pelvis being a threat to national security, I mean, if your idea of national security is a continuation of 400 years of white dominance and white supremacy, then yes, Um, Elvis Presley and jump jive and early rock and roll are a threat to the status quo and that's why i love it so much you know my my stepfather once told me a story about being in a movie theater when blackboard jungle came out blackboard jungle had one of the first movie soundtracks that was exclusively rock and roll tunes and one of them was bill haley's rock around the clock and when the credits rolled on that movie rock around the clock started playing louder than anybody had ever heard it because it was a movie sound system and all the kids just jumped out of their seats and started dancing because it was still dark in the theater and they weren't going to get caught and arrested for dancing in the deep south at the time and My stepdad, being a young guy, like 15 or 16 years old, he said he felt like the theater was going to explode, like that energy was so intense. And I, I love that so much. But before all of that can happen, we had to have this like evolution from jazz to rock. And what that was in the form of Jump Jive was pretty big touring ensembles made up of a drum kit, what they call a doghouse bass, or we call upright bass now, um, two or three saxophone players, a couple of trumpet players, and maybe a pianist, maybe a guitar player, and a front man, a singer. And in this case, it was Winoni Harris. And of all the jump jive singers, I think Winoni Harris's voice is one of the ones I love the most. He's got this great rasp in his voice you'll hear in a second. And, you know, blues shouting, as they called it, uh, which is being the front person for a, a, a jump blues band, Um, or rhythm and blues band uh, was sort of a combination of gospel singing, jazz singing, blues singing, and um, just like shouting. And Winoni Harris was such a great personification of mixing high culture with low culture. You've got all these sort of classical instruments on stage, but you've also got 
a string of hits when Oni Harris had some really like what they call risque blues hits with songs with titles like I Like My Baby's Puddin' or um, Keep On Churnin', which was used the double entendre of a butter churn and that same kind of action and, and like sex. Songs like Wasn't That Good or All She Wants to Do Is Rock, which were, you know, they were just about sex, but they were, you know, cleverly enough cloaked in entendre that they could be sold as as rock records. You know, under the rubric of race records, which both black and white audiences bought white audiences, mostly because it was risque and a way of kind of, you know, wink, wink, it's dirty. And, um, you know, Winoni had 15 top 10 hits in his life, and a lot of those were those kind of tunes. Yeah, so Winoni Harris, born August 24th, 1915 in Omaha, Nebraska. Um, he was a high school dropout at the age of 16. He was part of a dance team with a woman named Velda Shannon. Uh in the 30s, he traveled to Kansas City, or actually right around 1940, and he saw Blue Shouters for the first time. Uh, he was probably part of the dance team. He went to Kansas City, and he saw this whole new rhythm and blues, jump blues movement starting, and he thought, I could do that. And so he ended up becoming a singer in a band called The Five Echoes. He also played in a band called The Sultans. He was a singer and guitar player and a guy named Preston Love's band. And then in 1940, he moves to Los Angeles and becomes... Um, a sort of staple performer at a club owned by Curtis Mosby, who was a black entrepreneur at that time uh, in Los Angeles and became known as Mr. Blues. Now, from 1942 to 1944, there was a musician strike in Los Angeles, and a lot of acts who had had regular gigs there uh, were forced to get out on the road and make a living touring. And it was while he was on tour in 1943 that he was spotted at the Rum Boogie Club in Chicago by Lucky Millinder. And Lucky asked him to join his band. Winoni Harris joins the Lucky Millinder band on March 24th of 1944. And that band moves to New York City. Now in 1944, Preston Love, who had played in a band with Winoni back in Omaha, joins Winoni in New York City and joins Millinder's band too. And it is with the Lucky Millinder band and his old friend Preston Love that Winoni Harris finally gets into a recording studio in 1944 and cuts two sides, one of which was Who Threw the Whiskey in the Well, which was the biggest hit for Lucky Millinder's band of all time. It was number one on the Billboard charts. It remained on the charts for five months. Now, there's a lot of information out there, especially on Wikipedia if you want to research it, but like the Lucky Millinder band then goes out on tour in support of Who Threw the Whiskey in the Well, and then Winoni and Lucky fall out over money at some point. And that's when Winoni becomes a solo performer. And that's when he starts the string of hits of all the sort of race record, double entendre records, but also some really solid stuff like this tune, Quiet Whiskey. This is around 1945. Winoni bops around to a couple of different labels, but eventually settles on the King Records label. And he cuts two sides there with a young piano player from Birmingham, Alabama named Herman Sonny Blunt. That's in 1946. Now, I know a couple of you out there are nerds like me who just drop their cup of coffee on the floor because Herman Sonny Blunt is the man who became Sun Ra. And this whole story, that's one of my favorite weird little coincidences that Sun Ra and Winoni Harris cut tracks together right after the war in 1946 at the height of Jump Blues. So through the rest of the 40s and into the early 50s, Winoni is cutting singles and having hits and touring and doing really well. In 1951, he records a cover of Don't Roll Those Bloodshot Eyes at Me, which may be his most famous performance. Lots of folks have heard that tune. But then in 1953, he cuts Quiet Whiskey. I'm sure the tune is cut with like a King Records house band. I don't have any idea how to find out who the personnel are on the track. But uh, it begins... Uh, like a Cole Porter tune with a little intro and this kind of bell-like maybe glockenspiel or something accompanying a little poem, almost a nursery rhyme really, where Winoni addresses a bottle of whiskey as if it was a person. Whiskey, whiskey on the shelf. You were so quiet there by yourself. Things were fine till they took you down and opened you up and passed you around. Now understand this is just a few years after Prohibition has ended and when they talk about whiskey, in my mind, we're talking about white lightning because a lot of Winoni's stuff is earthy. It's not super urbane. And while most folks think of corn liquor, white lightning, moonshine, whatever you want to call it, as being a hillbilly thing, I grew up with it being a thing that people had who liked strong whiskey and had connections with country people, black, white, whatever. 
And I, I actually have a pretty terrifying and hilarious story about some Irish guys that were staying with me once and discovered a mason jar full of moonshine on a high shelf when it was well past time for everybody to start winding down and go to bed because everybody had already been drinking and it was like, you guys don't want any of that action that's going to end badly. And it kind of went the way this song goes. So, yeah, let's, let's jump into the song. Whiskey, whiskey on the shelf. You were so quiet there by yourself. Things were fine till they took you down and opened you up and passed you around. It starts so peacefully, right? It's like the calm before the storm. Like, everything's fine. It's just a little get-together. We're going to get this jar of whiskey down and open it up. John was the first one to pull you down. He took one drink and he started to clown. Whiskey has already claimed its first victim. John took one sip and started to clown. Uh, you know, that's such a moonshine story you know we used to refer to it as hillbilly lsd like you sit around sipping it for like half an hour the next thing you know you're running through the woods with no pants on going passed you the hazel jane and jack penelope got you and passed you right back this is such a classic sort of whiskey story john was the first one to pull you down he took one drink and started to clown passed you to hazel jane and jack penelope got you and passed you right back oh there's my new clock talked about that in the intro to the last episode i have a beautiful old clock that belonged to my great-grandfather it's on my mantle now and it's 10 o'clock so it's going to ring a few more times i forgot to count so i'm just going to wait oh that was 10 all right that old clock was in my great-grandfather's family until he passed it to my grandfather who kept it in his house for 60 or 70 years and then when he passed it went to my mom's house, and then when she passed, I got it. That clock's 140 years old, 130 years old, something. Anyway, keeps perfect time now that i figured out how to wind it. And um, Anyway, that's a bit of a digression, but that's, that's my new clock. Yes, so Penelope appears to be the only person at the party with any sense. Penelope got you and passed you right back. And then almost immediately, like so many parties where the hard liquor comes out, this thing starts to spin out of control. The doorbell rang, and what did you see? In walked Henry, Fred, and Marie. They hit you high, they hit you low, they hit you fast, and they hit you slow. The doorbell rang, and what did you see? In walked Henry, Fred, and Marie. They hit you high, they hit you low, they hit you fast, and they hit you slow. I absolutely love the timbre of Winoni Harris's voice. It's not just because it's got this great rasp, but there's this incredible musicality to it. And I want to call your attention to what happens when he hits the end of that phrase. This is not like a session that was recorded in multiple takes. I guarantee it. There was probably like four microphones. Winoni got one. There was one pointed at the rhythm section. There was one pointed at the band. And, you know, like maybe one more. And and it was all probably done in three or four takes as a single take. So when Winoni hits the end of that, first verse he's headed into a big note at the beginning of the first chorus and there's this gasp for breath listen closely they hit you fast and they hit you slow man that's so real it's so good this is not an auto-tune session or a multi-track session winoni hit all of those notes in, in one pass and he nailed it but also, like that breath is is just it's elemental and gritty. I'm gonna just I'm just gonna isolate the breath here. Listen, and that's like the foundation of the first note of the chorus, which is this great just yelp. Listen, whiskey. I'm sort of surprised no one has ever sampled just the whiskey there for a hip hop track or something where that's looped because it's so great and bell like and and. It's just got such a great timbre. He's got such a great voice. I just, I love his singing voice so much. Here's the whole chorus. Whiskey on the shelf. You were so quiet there by yourself. Things were fine till they took you down. Opened you up and passed you around. It's genius, isn't it? I just love this tune so much because that chorus is so great. And it, it's just restating the, the intro, you know, the sort of nursery rhyme intro. And the whole thing's got this almost Dr. Seuss-like meter, but... Uh, it's a dance tune, and it's a dance tune about a party uh, gone out of bounds, to borrow a phrase from my uh, hometown compatriots, the B-52s. Now, before we start talking about the sax solo, which is going to take a big chunk of my attention because it's so good, I want to talk about the form of the song a little bit. The tune is in A-flat, and it's a 1-4-5 blues tune. 
a lot of this like jump blues, early rock Billy, early rock and roll follows the format one four five. Now I said earlier we'd talk about what one four five means. So let's say we start a major scale on A flat. It'll sound like this. <laughs> So that's eight tones in the major scale. A flat, B flat, C, D flat, E flat, F, G, A flat is the octave. So when you talk about one, four, five, one is the first note of the scale, which is A flat. And if you make a chord out of A flat major, it sounds like this. The fourth note is D flat. Uh, if you make a chord out of that or call it the four, that's D flat major and it sounds like this. And finally, to complete the one, four, five progression, you have the fifth note of the A flat major scale, which is E flat or the five. So there's, I'm sure, like a half dozen music theory guys out there shaking their heads like I can't believe we're talking about one four five but like if you're like me you grow up hearing the phrase one four five blues or um twelve bar blues with one four five or whatever and you were like okay one four five is that like is that an address or something like I don't know and it wasn't until I got really serious about guitar that I found out that like the numbers of the notes in the scale make the chords which make the progression and so in a 12-bar blues, um, and I'm not going to play a whole 12-bar blues passage here, but you go from the 1 to the 4 back to the 1 to the 5, and you've heard this a million times in your life. Well, I said I wasn't going to play a whole 12-bar blues, and then I played a whole 12 bars, but... um. That's the basic structure of the verse and the chorus in this tune. and But really, like, the horn section is kind of vamping a little bit uh, and playing this ba da da figure while the bass player is really the one carrying the one four five 5 really solidly. And he's really improvising a lot. It's an upright bass, and the recording's not super distinct, but he's playing some super cool parts. He's working a lot of, like, blue notes in, in the major scale, and working all around the scale, so I'm not even going to try to like show you what he's doing because he's way more talented at at, at rhythm uh, melody than I am. But um, he just listen closely to the bass if if you want to find a whole other level of this song. He's a great bass player, and then then the saxophone solo starts. Let's just play that real quick. <laughs> So after the initial little uh, rising figure uh, of three notes, the saxophone player plays the same note for six measures, which is not something we normally associate with jazz improvisation. Like this almost, uh, it's almost like a drum solo. Bop, 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 six measures of the same note. And I want to talk now a little bit about R&B saxophone in the jump blues era. So because I've said so many things that are bound to start arguments with people who are really into music theory or really into jazz history in this episode, I'm not going to stop now. Uh, it has been said that the first R&B saxophone solo is Illinois Jackhead's solo in the Lionel Hampton tune Flying Home, which is also this rat-a-tat-like, uh, almost entirely rhythmic solo for a big chunk of it. And it was a whole different approach to saxophone. Up to this point, saxophones were a sweetening instrument that was used to build these complex harmonies with two altos, two tenors, and a berry to like build uh, a voice uh, very close to the human voice of crooning. And then Illinois Jacquette comes out with this, ama and he's also just an amazing player and did some sessions with Winoni on Philo Records before he jumped to King Records, I think. And he was this like guy who was willing to bring the barrel house gut bucket thing to saxophone and it's a different approach but it's also really exciting now i mentioned kansas city earlier and kansas city was this sort of world center for jump blues rhythm and blues jazz like juke joint music and it was kind of considered new york's 
kind of grittier cousin out in the plains. And one of the things that started in Kansas City, uh, if I'm not mistaken, jazz historians, if you're not mad already, you can send an email to crash and ride at protonmail.com and tell me I'm an idiot. But walking the bar was a thing that a lead player and an orchestra would do. Now, what do I mean by walking the bar? There would be a solo section. And also, we should now talk for a second about the length of 78 RPM sides. When you were cutting a tune for a 78 RPM record, you had about three and a half to four minutes at the most. So you weren't going to do the extended solos we talked about earlier for, you know, the dance floor mix where you had six or eight solos just to keep the tune going and keep people on the dance floor. You had one, maybe two fast solos that were 12 bars to fit in the 12-bar format. And um, that's what you're getting a taste of here on this record. But I guarantee you when they played this tune live, like that solo went on and on and on. And the sax player or trumpet player would walk out onto the bar where everybody's drinks were and would play a really dramatic, really emotional solo. And uh, it wasn't always the most technically adept performance. Now, I found an interview with Benny Golson, who was a great sax player from that era, and he was talking about walking the bar. He says, quote, I don't know where it started. It didn't start with the jazz artist per se. It started with one of the entertainers. An entertainer's plot is to do or to second guess what the audience wants to hear. Yeah, I got involved in that. I did some crazy stuff when I was doing all that stuff. You do what you think is going to entertain him. It's going to bring a claim to what you're doing. Yeah, what's more ridiculous than getting up on a bar where the drinks are to start playing your low B flats, no matter what key you're in, just honking. We call that honking and stepping. They're applauding. Ain't nothing happening. Stepping over those drinks. So, you know, when I talk about this, like, high culture versus low culture, like, there were a lot of the jazz guys who weren't really jump blues or blues guys who kind of looked down on this. But, like, I'm not ashamed to say that my background is in punk rock. I like, like, exciting, simple stuff. Like, it doesn't need to be too heady for me. And I love these kinds of, like, barrel house Walk in the bar solos. I'd give just about anything to have seen that live and to witness that solo, especially the long version. Um, Because I just think it smokes. And I'm sure that as it went on, it would get more and more complex, but also would probably eventually like come back downtown like a cannonball and go back to that like polyrhythmic, like blasting pattern. I I just dig it, man. It's exciting. All right. So we're on to the next verse. Most of the band has returned to kind of a pocket thing, except for those horns that are playing that sort of hook figure. Um, by the way, notice the drums are just slamming two and four all the way through this tune, which was, you know, sacrilege for jazz guys at that time. Like the hardcore jazz guys, snare drum was an an accent instrument. It was not a timekeeping instrument. That was for the ride cymbal. So this is funky and downtown and dirty. Um, the lyrics for the next verse go, killed you dead and wanted another. They reached on the shelf and grabbed your brother. It's a shame the way they did you in. They reached up and got your brother, Jen. So now we're out of whiskey, and we're moving on to other liquors. Killed you dead and wanted another. They reached on the shelf and grabbed your brother. It's a shame the way they did you in. Then reached up and got your brother, Jen. So far, we've only discussed... um, alcohol that was brewed at home you know bath of gin and white light and whiskey um but in the next verse uh they find a bottle of wine grandfather wine began to tremble with fright wondering if the party was gonna last all night grandfather wine knew without a doubt he was next in line if the juice ran out another great heaving gasp for breath as we go into the second course second course a little more understated than the first but it sets up the actually slightly better sax solo. Whiskey on the shelf. You were so quiet there by yourself. Things were fine till they took you down, opened you up and passed. A couple of things I want to point out um, in the chorus of the hand claps, of course, which are great. And also just as they're coming back to the end of the chorus before the solo, there's a great little bass walk down. Doom, 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 doom. And the 
snare drum does this great like little 16th note rough before the sax kicks off listen until they took you down open you up and pass you around I guess it's like 3E and a 4E and a, and it mimics the pickup for the sax that's coming in, which is 1E and a 2E and a, and, um, and then of course the sax just blows the roof off. So there's 12 bars of alto saxophone. Uh, playing this great uh, melodic and and very rhythmically complex solo. Alto sax is the sort of higher pitch of the two saxophones in this ensemble. Um, and it's it can be kind of screamy and it's a little raspy in this solo, but not crazy. It's not doing that screechy thing that makes your dog turn his head sideways. We get 12 bars of that. And then the tenor player steps forward and plays this much cooler, almost sultry solo. And we get 12 bars of like kind of, I don't know, man. The, I hate to use the word creamy because it's kind of cheesy, but like, this is a great sounding solo. Listen. That fluttering run at about, I guess, measure 10 of that solo where he's. Um, Really like working the vowels fast to get this fluttering effect. John Coltrane, he came up through that like barrel house gut bucket scene that we've been talking about this whole time before he became, you know, like a bop legend. He he was a working musician and, and he walked the bar some. And I think that he brings that fluttering, super fast thing to that sheets of sound thing he used to do in the soprano sax that drove a lot of the writers at Downbeat Magazine insane because they just hadn't caught up with where John Coltrane's head was at. And talk about a guy who blended like the high with the low, like John Coltrane was a master of that. And I think that he brought some of that barrel house technique to bebop. So in the final verse, we get to see the aftermath of all this partying. Um, and it ain't, it ain't pretty. Uh, now look at everybody. They've got real tight. Now they want to start a fight. Man, ain't that the way when you're whiskey drunk? John never did nothing wrong in his life. Now he's in a corner with a policeman's wife. Oh, hell, John. Um, Frank's so drunk he can hardly see, trying to make love to Penelope. And she's the one who didn't uh, hit the bottle too hard when it came around the first time. So she took a bottle and hit him in the jaw. And that's when the neighbors call the law. Now look at everybody, they've got real tight Now they want to start a fight John never did nothing wrong in his life Now he's in the corner with the policeman's wife Frank's so drunk he can hardly see Trying to make love to Penelope She took a bottle and hit him in the jaw That's when the neighbors call the law I love that that breath is there at the end of every line before the chorus because like if I was a recording engineer on this session now uh, it would be like highlight, command E, command M, which is highlight, separate, mute, and just make the breath go away. But the fact that it's there every time kind of fills my heart with joy that just how like real this track is. And I don't mean real and like that you can hear every breath and, and the fact that it's recorded live. But I mean, just like this is a, this story is so true to life that I, I love everything about it. Whiskey on the shelf You were so quiet there by yourself Things were fine till they took you down Opened you up and passed you around One last chorus and a coda with some xylophone And I love that in the sustain of the last note With the two saxophones One of them is a little sharp Like as it goes, there's a little like bend down, a half step down, and one of them's not quite caught up with the other one. Listen closely to that. And, of course, the buzz roll on the snare to the, like, nice solid thump of that giant kick drum. You can tell how big that bass drum is just by hearing how it echoes in the room. It's a really great sound. Some kind of weird noise there, too. Like, it's a very, like, gritty, real recording session i think it was recorded in new york king records was based out of new york i don't think there was any reason to go zipping around the country to make records back then i think you did them between tours and got them knocked out and went out and played shows so 
Yeah, that's Quiet Whiskey by Winoni Harris. It's one of my favorite tunes of all time. If you enjoy this at all, I, I can't recommend enough. Like I envy people who haven't really jumped into that whole post-war jazz era because it's just so rich. There's so much good stuff. Louis Jordan, Ain't Nobody Here But Us Chickens, uh, Big Joe Turner, Shake, Rattle, and Roll. Um, of course, all of the Winoni Harris stuff. Which includes the songs like Grandma Plays the Numbers and Good Rockin' Tonight. Good Rockin' Tonight has an Illinois Jack Hat solo, and it's really, really worth checking out. It's really great. And then, of course, there's Big Mama Thornton, who wrote Hound Dog, which, of course, Elvis Presley later made into a huge hit. And um, the early Etta James stuff kind of touches on this a little. I mean, there's just so much there. And the deeper I've dug in the past, the better tracks I found. And I thought, why doesn't the world know about this stuff? I mean, I really love a lot of the early rockabilly stuff, too. But when I found out that this is where it came from, I was like, man, that's not even a patch on this other stuff. This is really amazing. So I'm going to try to put together a playlist for this episode. I realize, like, this, number one, this is really late. It's been kind of a slack couple of weeks for me. And I'm behind on updating the website and blah, blah, blah. So um, give me a chance. But hopefully I'll have, like, a nice hour, hour and a half long playlist of 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 Jump Blues stuff for you to listen to. And uh, I'll put it on the Spotify playlist so you can check it out. All right, that's episode 48, Quiet Whiskey by Winoni Harris. Thanks for listening. Uh, thanks to our erstwhile producer, Jake Kreger. He is getting the YouTube channel updated. By the time you hear this, it may not be fully ready to go, but before too long, we're going to have a YouTube channel, which means at some point you may see my ugly mug on there. Um, Jake is an incredibly hardworking guy, and he sends me show notes after every show. If the show is better than it used to be, or the first time you heard it, that's all due to Jake. Thanks also to Gene Wolfolk and The Powder Room. The Powder Room provides all of the music that you hear on Crash and Ride, except for, of course, the Winona Here stuff you heard on this episode, but that's all from their first record called Curtains. You can find it at thepowderroom.bandcamp.com. Download that record, throw them a couple of bucks. Also, check out the record Lucky, which I played on. I didn't play on Curtains, but I was in the Powder Room long enough to play on the record Lucky. Um, they're great guys. Gene Wolfolk has been out on the road with the band Plaque Marks. Uh, they open for the Jesus Lizard somewhere. I'm super jealous of uh, Gene. He's a really great guitar player. He's a left-handed wonderkin uh, like mind-bendingly great guitar player. Um, hopefully I'll have some links to his new band stuff. Uh, he's got a band called Dream Tent. So, you know, Gene's out there. He's plugging away. He's a really, really great musician, and, and I'm really glad to know him. Uh, thanks to Heil Audio. They gave me a great deal on a pair of PR40 microphones. That's what I use for all of these broadcasts. Um, they were a huge improvement over the microphones I used to have. Back in the day when I had a recording studio, I used the PR40 on snare drum, kick drum, and sometimes bass cabinet. I've also discovered now they're, they're great broadcast microphones, and I'd recommend them if you're thinking about upgrading the audio on your podcast. All right. Man, I'm sorry I was gone for so long. I apologize. Uh, maybe some of you guys got caught up. I know I've been shotgunning you with content the past few months, so, um, but uh, it's good to be back, uh, and it's good to be with you guys again. So until we speak again, take care of yourself. Be kind to yourself. Ask for help if you need it. Go see live music. Support your favorite band. And remember, loud guitars save lives. <laughs>